Be with us, Lord, that you fill this place with your spirit, Lord, that you help our worship to be um, glorifying to you and um, that you get all the glory that you deserve. I pray that you be with Joe this evening, Lord, that you give him the words to speak. And um, I just we pray that you be glorified in all that goes on, Lord. We're thankful and we praise you and worship you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
God in the stream of life, that the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the ways of His mercy. As deep cries out to
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for the blessing of gathering tonight in your name, Lord. And uh, thanks for bringing us here tonight. And thanks for this time, Lord. And Lord, we just plead for the presence of your spirit to be with us tonight, Lord, please. Um, we feel kind of empty without our pastor, Lord. But um, we thank you for the time of rest you're giving him and his family, Lord. And we just pray you be with them, Lord. You be close to them. You draw them near to you and they draw near to you, Lord. During this time, they just get the rest that they uh, they need, Lord, with you and the time with you, Lord. And uh, thank you for sending them to us. Thanks for providing, providing them, Lord. And we just pray you be with them tonight, Lord. And Father God, we miss those members of our group that are not with us tonight, Lord. We, uh, so many are sick, Lord. So many are struggling. And uh, we know you can gather them, Lord, and we ask you to gather to them tonight with us, Lord, from their homes, from the hospital, wherever they would be, Lord. And uh, Father God, we want to see those little babies, and we want to see their mom and dad walk through the doors of this church. So would you please be with them and uh, gather them tonight, too, Lord, in the, uh, in the hospital, and uh, bring them back to us quickly, Lord. And uh, we just pray for the presence of your spirit, Lord, that you would speak tonight. Lord, and that everybody here would just uh, would grow in their personal relationship with you tonight, Lord. And we ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We'll be in Second uh, Timothy tonight, Second Timothy chapter 1. But if you'll take a break for about two or three minutes, say hi to somebody, and then we'll get started.
All right, if you want to make your way back to your seats, we'll get started. All right, so we'll be in the book of 2 Timothy tonight, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we'll also look at Acts, Acts chapter 1, and 1 Kings chapter 17, if you want to find those in your Bible. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, and 1 Kings chapter 17. I know it's Thursday night, but if you don't mind, uh, if you would please stand with me as we read the Word of God together. Second Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this amazing chapter and this amazing book in your word, Lord. And uh, we just pray, please, that you would just speak to us tonight through the, the words this chapter, Lord, and uh, that your spirit would just uh, consume this place, Lord, please, and speak to each and every one of us as only you can, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated, thanks. So the book of 2 Timothy contains some of the last words of the Apostle Paul, and these words are in a letter a letter to a fellow Christian. And Paul's in jail, knowing that he will soon depart from this world. He'll be martyred for his faith, executed because he believes, because he believes in Jesus Christ. It's time. It's time, and he knows the end is here. When he tells Timothy later in the letter, that I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, and I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Facing what the world calls death, Paul writes a final letter, a letter of encouragement to Timothy, a letter to a fellow pastor who he calls his dearly beloved son, Facing death, Paul writes a letter about life, about eternal life. In his first letter, Paul told Timothy to lead a quiet and peaceful life, to let no man despise your youth, to be an example of the believers, and to fight the good fight of faith. And ultimately, Paul told Timothy in the first letter, remember that there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And the words in the second letter, while they speak of the love Paul has for Timothy, they ultimately speak of his love for Jesus, his love for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1 where it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Facing his imminent death in a cold dungeon, in a small dark cave in the ground, Paul talks about the promise of life, eternal life in Christ Jesus. And with love, in verse 2, he writes to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Most of the letters that Paul wrote 
they all began the same way. In the letters to the churches and to people, he greeted them with the words grace and peace. But when he wrote to pastors, like in verse 2 of this letter to Timothy, he also included mercy. To pastors, his greeting was always grace, mercy, and peace. Because Paul knew that pastors need mercy. The pastors need the mercy of God more than the rest of us. In the book of James, it says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. God's pastors will be held accountable, accountable for caring for and teaching the people they've been given, accountable for shepherding their flocks, So in this letter, Paul is not just writing to his beloved son in the faith. He's writing to a young pastor who will especially especially need the mercy of God. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers that God ever raised up. And he put it this way. Did you ever notice, he said, this one thing about Christian ministers? That they need even more mercy than other people? Although everybody needs mercy, ministers need it more than anybody else. And so we do. For if we are not faithful, we shall be greater sinners even than our hearers. And it needs much grace for us always to be faithful. And much mercy will be required to cover our shortcomings. So I will take those three things to myself, he said grace, mercy, and peace. You may have the other two, grace and peace, but I need mercy more than any of you. So I will take it from my Lord's loving hand and I will trust and not be afraid, he said, despite all my shortcomings and feebleness and blunders and mistakes in the course of my whole ministry. Pastors need the grace of God, and pastors need the mercy of God, and pastors need the peace of God. How blessed, how blessed as a Christian, how blessed to have a pastor who stays true, stays true to the word of God, a pastor who simply teaches the word of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and word by word. A pastor sent by God to teach the word, to love the people that God gives him, and to pray for them. And pastors especially need God's grace, mercy, and peace when they aren't allowed to gather with their flock when they are told to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Our pastors need our prayers, and we need to pray for them without ceasing. We need to be constant in prayer, steadfast and watchful. We all need to call upon the Lord and pray fervent prayers for the men raised up by God, raised up to simply teach his word. Pastors need grace, mercy, and peace. And we need to pray for them as they lead a church built upon the solid rock, the solid rock of Jesus Christ, not shifting sand. We need to always pray for our pastor and all pastors. Like Paul prayed for Timothy, As we see in verse 3 where Paul writes, I thank God. In prison, Paul says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. It's prayer. 
And how blessed is Timothy to have Paul praying for him. The great apostle Paul praying for him night and day. And how blessed are we to have someone praying for us, praying for us without ceasing. Because the prayers of the great apostle Paul, they are no more powerful than the prayers of a pastor for his congregation. They're no more powerful than the prayers of a mother for her child. No more powerful than the prayers of a husband for his wife. And they are no more powerful than those from a thief on a cross asking to simply be remembered. Because God hears our prayers, every single one of them. Jeremiah 29, it says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. And God says, I will hear you. Jeremiah 33, he says, Call unto me, and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. In the book of Psalms, it says, The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth. Psalm 18 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. And in Psalm 30, verse 2, it just simply says, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and you have healed me. When our words fail, and when we can't speak, the Bible says that God keeps track of our sorrows. He collects our tears in his bottle and records each one in his book. God hears our words, and God hears our cries. And God attends unto our prayers. Look at verse 3 again. Look at verse 3 where Paul writes, I thank God that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee. Paul thanks God for reminding him to pray for Timothy. Paul is also reminded of when he last saw Timothy, two believers in Christ being separated from each other, God continuing Paul on his missionary journey, and God leaving Timothy without Paul in Ephesus, and Paul greatly desiring to see him again, remembering his tears and how much he loves them. How great that God puts it on our hearts to remember people in prayer. He doesn't even leave that up to us. He reminds us to pray for those that we care about, for those that we love, for those who are lost and lonely and brokenhearted, and for those pastors who simply want to gather with their flock and teach the word of God. So even when we pray, we need to thank God and give all glory to God because only God, only God can create love like this. Love between Paul and Timothy. Love between a pastor and his flock. Love between a mother and a child. Between a husband and a wife between a sinner and a savior, and between Christian believers. Only God, only God can do that as he reminds us of our tears and fills us with his joy. In verse 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned or the genuine faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. What a gift. What a gift to teach, chi to teach children about Jesus Christ in our homes, Sunday mornings in church. What a gift to tell little children that Jesus Christ loves them. And what a blessing for a mother. And what a blessing for a grandmother. And to have no greater joy than to hear that our children 
of walking in truth, that they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What a blessing. Wherefore, it says in verse 6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Stir up the gift of God, Paul says. Fan the flames, your translation might say. Move past the doubt, Timothy. Move past the fear. You need to fulfill God's will for your life. Stir up the gift of God. Use the gift, Timothy. Use the gift you've been given. Let God use you to simply touch the lives of others, to help those struggling in a lost and a broken world. Stir up the gift, he says. Use the gift in order that your gift be increased. Be strong, be bold, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Use your gift, Timothy. Preach simply the word of God. And if you simply preach the word of God, he said, the spirit, the spirit will guide you. The spirit of God will guide you. Because it says in verse 7 that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, one of the primary things that keeps us from using the gifts that God has given us is fear. Fear. Being afraid to reach out. Afraid of being laughed at, mocked and ridiculed. So we live in fear, content to just coexist in this lost world. But why should we ever be content to simply exist when we can truly live? Timothy was young. He was timid, sick, and frail, often in tears and very emotional. Yet remember David? Is this all your sons, Samuel asked Jesse? Well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's just a shepherd. He's just a shepherd boy. Yet through Timothy and David, we're reminded throughout the Bible that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God takes Timothy in his weakness and has him stand strong in the power of God. And, the, and David, while the world looks down on a shepherd boy, God simply raises up a mighty king. For the Lord, the Bible says, sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord the Lord looks on the heart. There's something in Timothy. And there's something in David. It's all throughout the Bible. It's in Peter. It's in Elijah. And it's in each and every one of us. Look at verse 7 again. Look at what God has given us. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, it says but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Love for God and love for one another and a sound mind. We're given love and a sound mind, and we are given power. Power. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, it says, But if the spirit of him 
that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. What this means and what God's saying in his word is that everything that Jesus did, everything, all the miracles, each and every one of them, everything, he did them with the same power that lives in each of us, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 5 of John, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. But the power, the power given by God, it isn't the power of this world. It isn't the power to control people. The power of God is found as we pray. The power of God is found as we love. As we love and as we serve the Lord. And as he allows us to serve others. Because true power, true power, absolute power, is the power that rises from supper and lays aside his garments and takes a towel and girds himself and pours water into a basin and washes the feet of his disciples and wipes them with a towel. Now that, that is power. And that same power, that same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead, it lives in us. The same power of God, the same Holy Spirit lives in us. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, it says in verse 7, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's power. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. It was also in Peter. It was in Elijah, David, and it's in us. So please turn to the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, look at verse 8 where Jesus says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power, Jesus says. And now turn to chapter 3 of Acts. Chapter 3 of Acts. Chapter 3, verse 1. Because here we see Peter. Peter, despite all his failure, we see Peter and John going up together into the temple, it says in verse 1. At the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping 
and praising God. Peter. Peter using the same power. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And a man, lame since birth, instantly walks, leaps, and praises God. Now turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, and we'll look at Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 17. And it came to pass, it says, after those things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my son to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, has thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came to him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, we see it in Peter, and we see it in Elijah. And that same power, the Bible says, it lives in us. Believest thou this? Jesus asked Martha before he raised her brother back to life. Do you believe me? Jesus said. Does God change? Is Jesus Christ truly the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do we do we believe? Would we reach out our hand, reach out our hand to a man crippled from birth? Reach out our hand and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Would we lay our body over a mother's dead son? Three separate times. The same power, the Bible says. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. It lives in us. The power of the Holy Spirit lives in us. So back in 2 Timothy, back in 2 Timothy in verse 7, it says that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But we must always remember that it is not our power. It's his power. It's God's power. It's God's power living inside of us. Charles Spurgeon said that God does not need our strength because he has all of that that he needs. He asks only for our weakness because he has none. He has none of that. God simply wants our weakness in his mighty hands so that we can receive his strength and so that his will, not ours, is done. And since we are not given the spirit of fear, 
but of power, love, and a sound mind. Paul tells Timothy in verse 8, to be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker or share with me. Share with me of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest or revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Don't be ashamed of a crucified Christ, Paul tells Timothy. Instead, proclaim a risen Savior and share with me, he said. Share with me, Paul makes it very clear. Share with me in the afflictions, in the afflictions you're going to have by spreading the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Don't give me your rules, Paul wrote to the Galatians. Don't let no man trouble me, he said. For I bear in my body the marks and the scars of the Lord Jesus. Don't give me your rules, he said. Don't tell me it depends upon my works or what I do. It's Jesus, Paul wrote to Timothy. It's just Christ Jesus before the world began. And now, now that Jesus has come and death is swallowed up in victory, Paul can be in prison facing execution. And he can say now more than ever with confidence, O death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? Because Paul knows. Paul knows that the light, the light has shined in the darkness. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Paul knows that Jesus, Jesus suffered for us and that Jesus died for us and that Jesus has saved us. So as we spread the gospel message, he says, be ready. Paul tells Timothy, be ready. Be ready to suffer. Be ready to be afflicted. And be ready to be persecuted. But don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't change the gospel message. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we preach to the non-believers, and as we teach the scriptures to the saved. Do not be ashamed, Paul tells Timothy. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has saved us. He saved us by the power of God, the power of God that lives in each of us. Now look at verse 12. For the which cause or for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against or until that day. You know, the best Christian worship songs that we sing the best ones contain the word of God. Words taken directly from the scriptures, directly from the Bible. The song was written in 1883, and the chorus, the chorus was taken from verse 12, word for word. The words are from the King James Bible, and the words were not changed to fit the music. The music was made to fit the words. And the verses, the verses to the song, they go like this. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me, redeemed me for his own. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word, 
brought peace into my heart. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, and then creating faith, creating faith in me. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, of weary days or golden days before his face I see. And I know not when my Lord may come, at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him, or if I meet him in the air. And after each verse of the song, the chorus was sung. The chorus taken word for word from the Bible. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 where it says, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I don't understand God's grace, the song says. I do not understand why God would ever choose me. And I don't understand how believing his word brings such incredible peace to my heart. And I have absolutely no idea what tomorrow brings, health or sickness, pleasure or pain. But I don't know. I don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. I don't know a lot. I don't understand a lot of things. But I know, Paul wrote, I know whom, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know, Paul said, I just simply know. The Bible contains mysteries, but I know, he said. I know whom I have believed. We believe Jesus, Jesus Christ. We give him our lives completely and totally. And we know, we know he is fully able to keep it. In Romans it says that I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Jesus, our absolute hope, Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is coming back very soon. So as we see in verse 13, We need to just simply hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwells in us. Hold on, he says. Just simply hold on. Hold on in faith. Hold on in love and hold on to the word of God. Wait for God. Listen in silence and keep our eyes upon Jesus. And when God is ready, when God is ready, we need to use his power and we need to move. We need to preach the word to non-believers and teach the scriptures to those who are saved. And we must hold fast the form of the sound words of the Bible and reject the false teachers. Trust God, not man. We try so hard. We try so hard. But all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As we're reminded in verse 15 where it says, This thou knowest, that all they that are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are by jealous and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. 
But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. At the end of his life on earth, the great apostle Paul was pretty much alone. He was by himself. How sad for him to be alone. How sad for a Christian to be alone. And how sad for a pastor to be without his people. Yet how wonderful. How wonderful for Timothy to have Paul. For David to have Jonathan. For Elijah to have Eliza. For Mary to to have Elizabeth, for a pastor to have a flock of God's people, and for us, for us to have Jesus Christ, and for him to give us each other. Yet our hearts, our hearts should break for Christians who feel alone, for Christians who are alone, especially those Christians who come and worship with us and yet still feel alone. The Casting Crown song says, Does anybody hear her? Does anybody see? Under the shadow of our steeple, the lost and the lonely people searching for the hope that's tucked away or searching for the hope that's hidden away in you and in me. Does anybody hear her? Does anybody see? I want them to be encouraged, Paul wrote to the Colossians, and knit together, knit together by strong ties of love, I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, more than ever, we need to be knit together. Knit together by the strong ties of God's love. Knit together. The Apostle Paul was pretty much alone. He was alone because some of his friends had died. Others had left him to follow false teachers. And so many others were afraid. They were just simply afraid. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? living in a time when people around you are dying, living in a time when people are alone, living in a time when everyone is fearful, living in a time when everyone is afraid. Who is God? Who has God placed on your heart tonight? Who has God placed on your heart tonight? Who is here tonight? Who lives next door to you? Who works with you? Who plays with you? Who just passes by and just simply looks at you, waiting? waiting for you to use the power of God inside you. Look around. Look around. Paul, Paul knew it was time. And we need to be aware of the time because there is very little time left. We need to speak. Tell people that Jesus loves them. 
that we love them and that Jesus Christ alone can save. We don't need a king. We have one. And he'll be back soon. What we need is just one Christian with one Bible to meet with one person. Just one Christian to open their Bible, to open the Word of God, and simply show one person that Jesus Christ saves and that Jesus Christ loves them. And then pray with them. Just simply pray. Today, there can be no one, no one close to us, nowhere anyone around, nowhere, no one anywhere around us, especially a Christian. No one can be alone right now. We simply cannot allow anyone to be alone. But the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, it is not just for us. It's for the lost and the lonely and for the brokenhearted and the lost and the lonely and the brokenhearted and those that are afraid. They are all around us. It's time. It is time now more than ever to simply tell one person that Jesus Christ is Lord and that they are not alone and that they are set free. They're set free and they're not alone because they have Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is simply all they need. Just simply Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for loving us, Lord. You know, who are we? Who are our families, Lord? Who are we as a body of people that you, that you would save us, that you would call us? Thank you so much for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your peace, Lord. Forgive us when we turned away, Lord, when we turned away from those that you sent to us, Lord. Give us your power, Lord. Take our weakness and give us your power and your strength, Lord. Encourage us, Lord. Provide us with the opportunities, please, Lord, to tell people that Jesus loves them, Lord. And Father God, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his wife and for his children. And we thank you that he stays true to your word, Lord. Each and every Sunday, each and every day of the week, Lord, book by book, verse by verse, word by word, Lord. Thank you for our pastor, Lord. Would you put, continue, please, Lord, to hold him close to you. Continue to guide him, Lord. Continue to comfort him, Lord. Draw him close to you. And give him the perfect peace, Lord. The perfect peace that only you can provide. And we pray you bring him back, Lord. Bring him back from this period of rest with his family, Lord. Bring him back strong. Strong for Jesus Christ, Lord. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a, have a good week, and I'll see you, see you on Sunday, God willing. <laughs>